This is Dr. Nurse Storms at Bryn Mawr College. I'm in my analytical room. This is where all our instruments are. As you'll, uh, what I'm going to show you how to do right now is how to run a, a, a Fourier transform infrared spectrum. Okay, so this is IR, what you learned in class to be IR. Okay, notice I'm geared up goggles, gloves, and white coat, or you should be wearing an apron. Um, infrared, of course, is a methodology to start, or at least uh, sometimes completely, but at least start figuring out the structure of a compound. Okay? The infrared spectrometer is right over here. This is the spectrometer, and this is the co computer that has the software that runs the spectrometer. The first thing you have to do when you, when you are going to run an infrared spect spectrum is you have to prepare a sample. On this instrument, we basically only run two types of sample. We either run what is called a solid film, which I'm going to show you how to do today, or we run a pure neat, and neat means pure, liquid. Okay? It's important to know what you ran because when you compare spectra to the literature, it'll be very specific as to what kind of um, spectrum it is. Okay? And you can't, you can't compare spectra that are in different phases. All right? That's really important. The other thing is sometimes we will run something called a KBR pellet, but we only do that when the film doesn't work because this new instrument is very sensitive and we can get away with very little sample on the plate. Okay, how do we prepare samples? Well, we universally use sodium chloride plates, sodium chloride or sodium chloride discs. Okay, these are sodium chloride discs. This is a relatively old sodium chloride disc, probably six months old, and it's all etched and dirty looking. Um, they get etched because they get exposed to water invariably because student samples have water in them and then some people just don't clean them properly. What these, these discs are made out of is sodium chloride that's been pressed at extremely high pressure. Okay, So I just want to show you what a new disc, disc looks like. This is what a new disc looks like. Okay, A new disc looks like as clear as, as a window. It's already smudged just because I touched it. Um, the fact that these are made out of sodium chloride should indicate to you that they cannot be washed with water. Um, and the more exposure they get to water or anything that's polar, li that's like water in terms of its ability to dissolve the disc, will etch the disc. But again, if you dump this in a beaker of water, it would just disappear. They're very expensive. Okay, most of the things in the lab are very expensive. Um, you do not want to be working with these over the air because students very frequently, and myself, drop them. And when you drop them, they shatter into 100 pieces, and they, they're, they're no good. They probably cost $20 a piece. So just remember that. You're not working with some piece of garbage. It's, it's, it's really important. Why are they made out of NaCl? They're made out of NaCl because sodium chloride does not absorb in the infrared. Okay. Now, I prefer to use older cells most of the time because um, the etching in the older cell creates some grooves that will actually hold the sample. Okay, so what I'm going to show you is how to apply a sample. So I have a little bit of a sample in here. You will probably take, so you can see this has, has some film on it, and I'm actually using one of my research student samples. I don't know how it's going to come out, to be honest with you. But I'll run this, and um, it's got a little bit of compound in it, and I'm just going to try to dissolve it in a little dichloromethane. So this is, we always have squeeze bottles of dichloromethane near the IR. Dichloromethane is very volatile. And it's so volatile that if it starts evaporating at the end, it'll actually create a siphon. If you get that siphon effect where it's running out and it won't stop, just open the lid a little bit, and that'll break the siphon. Okay? Um, what I do to prepare a sample is put a tiny bit of dichloromethane in. We don't get, like, exact quantities on this. Beginning students always want exact quantities. I just put, like, a little squeeze in. Okay? It's kind of like cooking. Um, you guys will take like a little spatula tip of your compound and you will put it in a, a little tiny beaker, a little tiny vial, anything you've got that's small, and then just put a little bit of solvent in it and get it to dissolve. My new methodology that I use these days to get the sample on the plate is I like to use a glass rod and then what I like to do is put my sample in the solution and just paint it onto the plate. I don't like using pipettes with this. Okay, I've had a lot of trouble with that. You might say, why have you had a lot of trouble? 
because the dichloromethane does not evaporate efficiently when you put a big blob of solution on top of the plate. So what I do is I just get a little bit on a glass rod and I paint it across the plate and in doing so, the dichloromethane evaporates immediately. It's very important to realize that you are not running a liquid sample. You are running a solid and you're using the liquid, the dichloromethane, as a vehicle to get the solid onto the plate in an even thin film. You are not running a liquid, so if you just pile up a bunch of liquid, then throw another plate on it and run it, you're really running a spectrum of dichloromethane plus your compound. Your compound's a solid. So if you just let it dry very quickly, it'll just deposit out. However, if you put a big blob of liquid on the top, what'll happen is, the, as the solvent's evaporating rapidly, it's, as you know, evaporation is endothermic. And because it's endothermic, it gets cold. And because it gets cold, it'll start condensing water, sometimes freezing water, onto the surface. And when that happens, we invariably see huge water peaks in the spectrum. Okay? So, how do you run liquids? If you're really running a true liquid, which you will also do many times in the lab, you just put a drop of liquid on a plate, a clean plate. Then you take a second plate and you, you sandwich it. And you really want it to stay a liquid, so you have to cover it up to keep the liquid in there. And I always call that running an Oreo cookie. Running, uh, running a um, solid is like running a half of an Oreo, and it's like you just have the cream part in there. Okay, so that it's half of an Oreo. It has to be bone dry. Okay, now how do we run the spectrum? This is the spectrometer. Okay, always take your gloves off when you're touching the lid. You should you, already people have dribbled all kinds of compound all over this lid. This is a brand new instrument. $20,000 instrument. We have to take good care of it. It already looks kind of beat up, and it shouldn't. Do not touch instrument with gloves, okay? Anyway, lift up the lid, and inside you'll see where the sample goes. It's very simple, and what comes through here is the infrared, all right? Frequencies. Now, and that they're detected on the other side. The sample sits in this mount, and it sits on these two prongs. Okay, the first thing I have to do is run a background. A background is a spectrum of the air, okay? So I'm going to put nothing in there. I always run my backgrounds of just nothing. You can also run a background of just a, a very clean cell. The problem is our, sometimes when lots of students are running, the cells aren't meticulous, and because of that, um, the background is not always perfect. All we want to do is see air. What's in air? Well, there's lots of stuff in air. However, it's mostly carbon dioxide and water. So we're essentially running a spectrum of carbon dioxide and water that will be subtracted from the spectrum of your sample, which will also have carbon dioxide and water. And by subtracting the two, what you'll have left is your sample. You don't want the air peaks to obliterate your spectrum. And that's how sensitive this thing is. Now, we have to really keep our eye on this because it happens very quickly. And I'm going to close the lid. And this has a very friendly user-friendly in interface. So I think you'll find when you use it, you can figure a lot of stuff out on your own. But I'm just gonna run the background first. And there's a little button up here that says background. Now watch down here very carefully. It says background 0%. This turns completely green. And I have to watch this. If I turn away for a second, I'm gonna miss it. It turns completely green when it's done. It says 100%. And you'll see the spectrum up there. The spectrum shows flashes very, very, very quickly. Um, and a water spectrum essentially has several peaks over here, like around 3,500. Um, <coughs> it'll have some peaks at about 2,200, which are from CO2. And then it'll have some bending vibrations. And you'll learn more about this in class from water over here. Again, I find with this new instrument, they're relatively minor because the instrument is extremely well sealed. All right, now what do I do? The next thing I want to do is open the instrument again and take my sample, which has, hopefully has enough compound on it. Sometimes this is a bit of an experimental process. Oops, and my sample fell. That's okay, that happens. And what I want to do is prop it up on those two prongs with the, I always say the dirty side out. It's not really dirty. The Oreo, the Oreo cream side should be out. The, the sample side should be out, okay? Notice I use my glove hand to put it up. I'm using my other hand for the instrument. Okay, now I'm ready to run, so I close the lid, okay, and now 
To run the spectrum, um, what you want to do is, first of all, give it an identification. Okay, so what I'm going to do is put in a sample ID. Um, uh, I'll just call it um, Pipper. I'm just going to call it what it is. Pipper and Ill alcohol product. This is a bit of an uh, abbreviation. And I am being kind of careful here because I don't want to touch this with my glove. Because if I have chemicals on my glove, it's going to dissolve the keyboard. Okay. Um, and, you know, if you want to write more here, you can. You could write description, some kind of a description of it if you want. This is usually pretty adequate because what it'll do is it'll say what sample number it is. And it usually puts the date on it and everything um, or, or we could put the date. We could just say uh, that is not the correct date, actually. Today's date is, I believe, October, what is it? Five. The fifth. 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 So you can write whatever you want in there. It's good to do this because another student will come right after you and run, and you want it stored. Okay, so I do that. Then what I do, what I do is hit scan. Okay, so I hit scan. So let's see how this comes out. This may be a, <coughs> a disaster. <coughs> I'm running a um, crude, crude product here. So it just ran. All right, this doesn't look too bad. It's not a disaster. All right, it's kind of what I would call a weak-looking spectrum. You can see it's rather weak. So I'm going to show you how I manipulate it a little bit. So you can see kind of this pink line. Now, notice, were I to run it again, if I were going to run it again, one of the interesting things about this instrument is that if you run it again, like if, if, if you scan it again, or say I took the sample out and I put more compound on it because I wasn't happy with it. If I did that and I ran it again, it would superimpose the next spectrum on top of the spectrum and kind of keep a running list of all my spectrum on the bottom. And you can, you can kind of manipulate it and get rid of spectra at your, uh, your, your discretion. So for example, um, if I took this out, say I take this sample out, which I just ran, I'm pretty happy with that. But let's say I run, I'm just going to run a standard that's going to give a very strong, a very strong spectrum. So this is something that's going to give a very strong spectrum. This is just a standard we use, it's called polystyrene film. So say I ran this and I just scan this for comparison's sake, okay? Again, this goes very quickly. I just want to show you how you can manipulate the data a little bit. Okay, so there's a very small, very strong looking spectrum. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. Okay, see, you can see my pink spectrum superimposed on that spectrum. So as students run, the spectra just sort of pile up. Now, I don't want this spectrum. I want the pink one. This, this is a standard. It looks gorgeous. It's an absolutely gorgeous looking spectrum, very strong. I want to get rid of that. If I want to get rid of it, I didn't even name it. But if I want to get rid of it, it's administrator, um, it's administrator 72, or it's just the green spectrum, and it gives each one a different color. It's kind of cool for students, because when students are running similar samples, they can tell if their sample kind of stacks up to the prior sample. So, so I hit administrator 72, because I want to get rid of it, and it says remove curve, and then I just remove the curve. So I got rid of it because I don't want it. But I just want you to know you can do that, and that's why it's really good to label your spectrum. You know what color it is? All right, what I don't like about this spectrum is it's too small. I can't really see it. So what I want to do is make a box around it. So you just grab this, the mouse, and kind of spread it over. And it's really important to make the box very short and wide, get the entire spectrum in it, but make it short and wide so that you can really expand this out, okay? Then you right-click on the spectrum, okay, and I rescale the graph. So I'm rescaling the graph. You guys are so clever. I am sure you will find 300 different ways you can do what I just did. This is a very friendly interface for people who are in their 20s and younger and a little bit older. Because everything's right on the surface. And a lot of students do it a different way. And I'm like, fine. If it works, it's good. That's how I do it. That's how old me does it. This looks like a nice spectrum for me because I can see all my functional groups and I can see my fingerprint region. Okay, what I'm going to do next is label it. This is a little tricky sometimes. Um, labeling can be done a couple different ways. 
Um, you can you can label such that all the la all the peaks that are found are labeled. All right, I'll do that. So um, I'm going to click on labels. Okay, this isn't a bad label. Um, what it gives you basically is it gives you all the peaks that it, 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 it deems big enough to be peaks, and it gives you the position of the peak in reciprocal centimeters or in wave numbers, and then it gives you the percent T, the percent transmittance. This is not a horrible spectrum for a solid because solids tend to reflect a lot of light back, and they particularly reflect the high frequency end of the spectrum. And that's why the spectrum has a bit of a tilt to it, but honestly, this is not bad. And when I look at this new instrument, this is a beautiful looking spectrum for a very, very, very small sample that I applied to that cell. Um, there's a lot of detail here. If you think this is too much information, you can change this and say, like, I only want to see the top so many peaks ranked by intensity, okay? So if I click this, I could say I only want to see the top 10. Okay, then I label... Um, that's, hold on a second, only top 10, um, let's see if it'll do this, label it again, there we go. So, what I did was I switched, and I only want the top 10, now notice it's only labeling a few things, but you can change that number, you could make it 20, or 30, or 40, so the thing is, sometimes when it's all, okay, when it's all the piece, it's too much, and they're all on top of each other, but this is actually very nice, and I can read it. Okay, once you're done with this, all you do is you go File, okay, Print. Again, you guys, you know, I haven't even played with this thing enough yet. It's pretty new. But I will tell you, there's all kinds of stuff you can do with this. You know, you, you guys, I know how to do this. You know how to do this. But you can take screenshots. You can send the information to your email. There's all kinds of things you can do with this. So if you want to do it, you can do it. But I'm just saying our basic, I'm showing you our basic IR. Then what you would do is you just go to our printer, click OK, and it, it prints across the hall. So you're done. All right. So then the only thing you really need to know then is how do I clean the plate, you know? So the plate is out now because I um, took it out before because I ran that other compound. And what you have to do is hold the plate. I'm not going to do it here, but hold the plate over a beaker. And use the dichloromethane. You have to be really gloved up, both hands. And you squeeze dichloromethane into it. So I could do it here, actually. My glove is not in the best condition. But you could, you could just run some dichloromethane over it like that into, into your container, even. And then what you do is you take a Kim wipe. And remember, stay over this. This keeps you from breaking plates. And then you would just clean it with a Kim wipe. And then someone else could use it. So it's a good rinse with dichloromethane into a beaker, wearing gloves and then a good buffing with a Kim White. Then it's ready to go again, okay? So I hope that helps you running your IRs in lab this week.